Okay, we're on to our last speaker of the session and the morning. Before I introduce him, uh, it does say on your agenda that we have a group photo after this. I've been told that we're going to do the group photo after lunch, so just keep that in mind. Uh, so our last speaker here is Robin Kim from the University of Virginia, and we're going to be hearing more about L-band drone measurements. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Robin. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Virginia. And I'm really glad that Michelle went before me because I did not put much background information in my slides. Um, but I'm speaking here on behalf of my teammates at my lab, uh, HydroSense. Our uh, advisor is Venkat Lakshmi and Jiwei Zhu, Renzi Zhang, and Bin Fang. Um, they were critical in helping me, or we basically worked together to get all the institute uh, data with the HydroGo probe. And Mike Kosh and Andy Russ, um, they were partnered with our lab. Um, and Arian Dai, Jack Elston, um, I've been pronouncing his name Mossier, but I've learned it's not pronounced that way. <laughs> and Alan Kutsowski, and they were responsible for creating the basically the technology that's um, being validated in the study. Um, and to give a like a very brief history, so Venkat was a um, he was a, a committee member on Arian Ar Arian's um, PhD uh, PhD uh, research, and that's how he heard about Black Swift, and he moved to UVA and got this grant to basically do a startup project, and, and we and he decided to do this. So um, it's not necessarily my thesis project, but it, this is something that's uh, been. Um, I was able, I'm, I've been uh, lucky in getting involved in. So I'll start. Um, so the motivation for why do we want drones for soil moisture monitoring? And um, we talked a lot about it for over the past couple of days. But uh, re regarding agriculture, um, it, I think with the current wave of ag the agricultural revolution, the the goal is to get um, fully automated systems with uh, that can. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, with fully autonomous with fully autonomous systems, and one pur one purpose being to improve water con con conserving measures while also rapidly responding to uh, hydrologic extremes, and we saw that the cost of field campaigns and network installations can add up pretty pretty quickly. Um, so it would be helpful to have these uh, a more um, uh, autonomous system where it can just get the data much more, more effective, efficiently. And um, with respect to satellite observations, drones, uh, airborne observations have a special purpose. They could help bridge the gap between the point-based observations and the coarser resolution satellite data. Um, so that's another motivation for this. Um, so um, as, as mentioned, Black Swift S2 is one of the first commercially available off-the-shelf passive microwave sensing um, soil moisture uncrewed aerial system. Um, and I'll just get to it. So the main equipment on this UAS include the MicaSense Altum, which has the RGB bands, um, near infrared, um, and, and um, the red edge bands. And this basically serves a purpose of gathering vegetation data and land surface temperature for correcting the brightness temperatures that the low the LDCR retrieves. Um, and the system is uh, set up with an air compressor, a launch rail, and the fixed wing itself. And I also have some videos here. Um, this is just an example of a launch. Um, but we saw that. And then a landing, which is just kind of a belly, belly land. Um, and this is just another um, example of flights and landing. And you might note, you might be asking yourselves, how safe is this, or how, what kind of um, procedures might be involved? I think that's going to be a work in progress. But um, the setup is pretty easy to kind of um, follow along. It takes about 20 minutes to get everything going. Um, and yeah. And during the in-flight portion, we have to be very cognizant of what sensor is actually getting picking up the data. Um, with the Altum, it's flown at the ceiling height at 120 meters above ground level. Um, and then uh, it has to go through another round of flights with the LDCR, basically with the drone power turned off because of radio frequency interference. 
Um, and um, it's and the resolution of that data is is effectively at the height of um, the altitude of the drone. Uh, but then it can be interpolated down, so it could you could technically get higher resolution data, which when I I'll show. And this is the field campaign component. So this is Jiwe on the left gathering uh, core samples with a core, and um, it it we got a range a good distribution of soil moisture samples so that we can calibrate the hydrogo probe measurements. And the vegetation cover was basically just weed and um, desiccated corn stubble from the previous harvest. Uh, and the soil texture is mostly sandy loam, loamy sand in that range. And this is the ortho mosaic of the field of the study site itself. It's the bark airfield. It's very, uh, it's it's pretty close to the scan site we visited on Monday, and you, you can see all this um, validation points that we use. There about there were uh, four, uh, 38 sites in total, but then um, one just did not fit in with the LDCR product itself. So, if, um, in total, 37 sites or validation points actually, and then on the right is just a. Uh, is a flight plan that Andy had uh, used to basically fly this drone. And there are ways to make it more efficient by not having the dr drone fly consecutive transects. But this is just um, the flight plan that we selected. And the landing strip was recommended to be about at least 100 meters. Um, it's highlighted in orange there. And the bounding box is um, about 50,000 50, square meters. So not very big. Um, it took about 20 minutes to get um, the full uh, area twice. And this is um, a resampled NDVI of the Altum or to the resolution of the LDCR. Um, and this was done just to kind of see compare or just to get a representative NDVI because we took measurements um, every day in the mornings or, and um, and for two days in the afternoons as well. And I'm gonna just briefly talk about the algorithmic basis. So I, I can't fully explain everything, but um, there's uh, the main like, body of uh, theory, theory is the soil vegetation radio transfer model. And there's a lot of different components that, um, that basically mess with the soil moisture signal that we're trying to get. There's the brightness temperature from the sky, uh, there's, emiss there's vegetation emissivities that um, affect the signal of the soil itself, their soil texture, and all the signals that get refracted. Um, yeah, but then the most important thing to kind of consider is the vegetation water content to, as a surrogate for the NDVI, or this NDVI as a surrogate for the vegetation water content, and some fixed values for the surface roughness parameters. That's actually based on a table lookup for the algorithm used in SMAP. Um, and this is like the actual workflow that they, that Arian um, created. Um, and you can see, um, I highlighted the vegetation correction surface cor correction, which is to get the actual brightness temperature from the canopy top. And then um, in that, the dielectric um, constant model is also incorporated. And what is essentially happening is a statistical algorithm. It uses some linear algebra to get error covariance matrices, which I cannot explain. But if you look at the paper, it's fully there. Um, and looking at the uh, calibration. So this is just looking at the gravimetric samples that were um, uh, calculated to volumetric soil moisture and the hydro probe samples. Um, and uh, something called the last loss tangent calibration was performed following this uh, method from Merlin et al. And um, yeah, uh, it's not. You see, you see some somewhat of a wet bias, or, or a dry bias with the hydrogo probe, and so you're getting wetter soil moistures with the uh, with the canned data. But then, in the final validation calibration or the final calibration, it's looking pretty good um, with a bias about about one percent and an unbiased root mean squared error about three percent. Just just looking at the hydrogo probe. And this is the time series of the dry down itself. So I have um, uh, the in situ data to your right, the bottom right, and then on the 
upper right is the LDCR soil moisture points themselves that are selected at the validation points. And on the left is just the histogram of all the pixels. So I try to color code it so you can see the dry down happening. Um, and I forgot to mention this, but with the in-situ data, we collected four points per site. So you see um, this distribution via the box plot. So it is capturing a dry down, but the question is, is it capturing like the exact soil moisture values we want? Um, and this is the time series as uh, graphed as maps. And the dots are basically the in-situ points um, that are averaged uh, per, uh, per site. Um, and the, it's color coded so that it's, if you see the really dark red, that's at 8% uh, percent or lower and at 40%. And the dark blue is 40% or higher. And you can see there is a pretty big distribution of soil moistures um, that are retrieved with the LDCR here. But then it's a lot drier in general. And this is just another convenient way to see that spatially averaged. But when you look at the average dry down between the first half and the second half of the week, it's pretty consistent. Um, but then even with the one standard deviation of, from the mean with the in-situ data versus the LDCR data, the LDCR data is just so much drier. Um, and we know that this pattern is representative looking at the scan, dry, the scan site um, just as a way to validate our own measurements. And this is a change matrix just looking at the morning time series, which is the morning flights to make a more um, uh, relevant comparison. So here there was actually, uh, it wetted, but there was no rain. It might be some uh, redistribution of soil moisture that happened overnight. Um, and then between Tuesday and, uh, or Wednesday and Tuesday, you can see this dry down uh, pattern pretty well. And with this bottom row, you see that by Friday, April 14th, it dried out a lot over the past three days. But um, so much of it was actually, uh, it, so much of the values by the end um, were approaching zero, as, which, which will be shown in the validation plot. Um, and yeah, here we see the spatially average flight validation points, the triangles are just all the pixels of the points that are averaged. Um, and the bias and the final bias was about negative 10%. Um, and the unbiased root mean squared error was about 5%. Um, and takeaway from this, this slide is, or this uh, figure is just that it's pretty biased towards drier, drier sampling. Um, and I think the more, interesting questions right now that we need to figure out are what are the sources of error. Even with two flights back to back from 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. on Monday, we had like this much deviation in soil moisture. The dark red is negative 10%, or, yeah, and then the blue is 10%. So we're not sure what's happening, but it's, it'd be good to do uh, multiple flyovers to understand that. And land surface temperature appears to be a very strong, um, have a strong relationship, which I'll show in a in a couple slides, but um, there was that much soil moisture difference within between uh, 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. So with the same key and color. And this is for uh, Thursday, April 13th. Um, and it's and I put some regression plots on just to show how the linearity was stronger in the afternoon flights for some reason versus the morning. Um, so something to consider here. Conclusion is that there is, like I said in the validation plot, th there's a reported bias of about 11% and an unbiased three mean squared of about 5%. But then there are potential concerns remaining regarding the calibration, the vegetation, the surface roughness corrections, and potentially georeferencing. Um, but uh, there, it did successfully capture a dry down, and I think there's a lot of value in this work um, and it's advancing soil moisture. Uh, remotely sensed soil moisture and to a degree that hasn't been hap that hasn't happened before and it's really encouraging to see um, another person working on it. Um, yeah so future work could there be other algorithms or other parameters in the lookup tables that can make the the final soil moisture estimates more accurate and or 
um, this is just a per internal question, like how to adjust landing operations for un for less experienced experienced pilots. Um, and these are the references. Uh, Mike Hosh took a lot of pictures, so thank you. Um, and he also did the drying of the soil samples with the with the gravimetric samples. And Dom Saruzzi, he's a professor at um, William and Mary. He took the video of that other um, of the second slide in slide five. And Alex Schroger was an intern at the USDA. He helped a lot at the year before. Um, he couldn't really see the final results, but he did that. And funding NASA and the NSF, because of that, I've been able to do this. And um, otherwise, I won't be able to do it. Thank you. Um, and if you, sorry, <laughs> and if you have questions, you can ask me and I'll direct you to the person who would be most relevant to answer. <laughs> Questions for Robin? Uh, two questions. Uh, one, do you mind sharing the software you used for flight planning? And two, did you look at uh, you know actual heat, wind speed, and relative humidity during times of rapid variation that you witnessed in the results? No, the, the latter, no. Um, there is interest in looking at it post-flight, but I haven't got had the chance to and regarding the flight plan um it blackswift has their own proprietary io os operating software oh <laughs> should have stayed where i was how much of the daily difference in moisture that you saw is related to plant rest respiration I, I don't mean, know because there if you if you have flux towers or whatever in yeah. a cornfield or some other type of of I don't know what your vegetation was there is a diurnal difference mm -hmm. in um the plant respiration and it I, obviously it's coming up through the roots it's it's uh absorbing water through the roots so it's some of what you're seeing in a dynamic relationship from day to day, how much of that you don't, you, you need to take a look at what the transpiration rate is for the, those, I don't know whatever vegetation you were working with. So I did look through at the NDVI to see if there was a relationship at all as, I'm, as a, as a proxy for plant respiration. I'm not sure if that's, if that makes sense. Um, but um, I couldn't find a strong relationship between that. It seemed like surface temperature was a stronger pr predictor of how correlate the soil moisture and the brightness of the were. Other questions? I'll ask one. Um, do you have any, do you have like a wish list of places where you want to take these high resolution drone measurements? Where are some of the places that you really want to fly these planes and why? Um, my personal interest is in mountainous regions. <laughs> because that is where my thesis is at. I'm looking at permafrost in high altitude environments. So I really need to talk to Michelle. Great, thanks. Um, Marina, I don't know if we have lunch here yet, do we? It, it doesn't look like we do. <laughs> okay. But, okay, so <laughs> we can all take a break. If we're, no more questions and uh, lunch will be here shortly, so. Todd was saying we could take a picture. The reason we're not doing the picture now is because we wouldn't have Mike. <laughs>